So Ephesians chapter 6 is a, is a chapter um, where we're going to start in verse 10 on spiritual warfare. It's kind of the final sermons will kind of be on spiritual warfare here. And let me start in verse 10. So Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. But against, and this is talking about spiritual demons, fallen angels, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then. Okay, I'm going to stop there. So, the Apostle Paul is going to talk about, and oh yeah, I see how I misspell wrestling. It's missing the L. Someone just pointed that out. No one else caught that until the, just rest, rest, resting? New term, okay. Wrestling with the enemy. So in verse, in verse 12, I know the NIV says for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but a lot of versions, and, and the Greek, I think it's better to go wrestle. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle with Satan in spiritual warfare. Now, I'm going to tell you I know some about wrestling. Any wrestlers here? Did anyone wrestle in high school or college? Jim? Jim? John? John, how, when did you wrestle? Eighth grade? And then you quit. Yes. Yeah, so you got smart. Okay. <laughs> Jim, when did you wrestle? In high school. All four years or? Junior, senior. Okay. Well, I, I don't know how I was led astray, but I wrestled in ninth grade. And um, I didn't like it. <laughs> I was the kid that everyone loved to wrestle. I know you might find this hard to believe, but I think I weighed like 80 pounds and I was easy to take out. And even though the coach would give me like, hey, you gotta make this move, do this move, he, he would train us on different moves. Whoever I wrestled always knew one or two moves ahead of me. <laughs> and I got pinned all the time. And after ninth grade, I went, wrestling's not for me. So in 10th grade, I went into gymnastics. And then I discovered there were kids that were in gymnastics at three years old that could do triple flips. And I needed help doing a single flip. And so after 10th grade, I decided gymnastics isn't for me. And then I discovered tennis. Oh, I found my niche. By the way, at, at my age, do you think people wrestle? Other than Wrestlers don't wrestle anymore. And when you get old, uh, talking about gymnastics, I didn't share this. The grandchildren were over like three weeks ago, and they're standing on their heads. And I go, I can stand on my head too. I thought I broke my neck. <laughs> I was saying it's so easy. I got up, I went right over, and I was like, oh, my neck. So my gymnastic days are definitely over. But I can still play tennis. I can still play tennis. So... Years ago, about 12 years ago, I, wrestling is the oldest sport in the world. It's a sport that's done in the most nations. It's usually only with men, but there is a resurgence in the world and in the United States because now women are wrestling. And I was watching YouTubes of wrestling in high school and I was like, wow, it has gone to a whole new level that I have never seen before. These girls, it was girls. This girl comes out and she's crouched down, growling like a lion, coming. 
I mean, I don't ever remember doing stuff like that when we wrestled, okay? We just like stood and then went to it. Um, so she comes out, she's growling, and then she leaps and takes her legs and wraps them around the neck of the other girl and takes her down and pin And I was like, wow! We never were taught those moves. I've never seen anything like it. Now, in Mongolia, I spent a week in Russia, a week in Mongolia. This is the wrestling outfits. It's only men are allowed to wrestle in Mongolia. It's the number one sport. They love it. When you visit them, they often will ask you, a man, you go into the house, a man will say, would you like to wrestle? Okay. <laughs> and I've learned my lesson. They taught me, but they didn't have to tell me. I am just going to drop to the ground immediately. Okay. <laughs> so I do want to tell you uh, a historical, and I think I shared this once before, probably six years ago. Only men wrestle in Mongolia, and, and every year there is one man that moves through the ranks above, for all the men in the country, and every year there's only, they don't have weight classes, but one man will come out who is the top wrestler and the hero for that year in that country. And one year long ago, they're wrestling, 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 and finally the person that was the top wrestler came forward, and then that wrestler announced, ah -ha! I'm a woman, and it was a woman, who had beat all the men. And national shame came upon all the men in the country that they had been beat by a woman. And it was that year that they decided to cut out the front of all of their shirts, the, of their wrestling outfits. So their wrestling outfits have sleeves. They used to be full shirts. They have sleeves and they have a back, but they cut the front out because a man says, we never, women are not allowed to wrestle, and to make sure that we never get beat by another woman, you have to wear this outfit, okay? So now, wrestling in Mongolia, as in many countries, as in the days of the Romans, was you both are standing, and the first person that falls down, the first person that touches any part of their body other than their feet to the ground, you lose. So it's kind of a you're wrestling, and whoever gets thrown down, and you hit your arm, your back, your stomach, your head, whatever, whatever, if you hit the ground, you're out. They're very polite, like over in Mongolia, shake hands, wrestle, thrown down, the winner takes his hand out to graciously lift up the loser, and then they shake hands again, and then they go their own way. I noticed watching the videos of wrestling in the United States, it, it is takedown, it is destroy, and it is tough luck. You <laughs> Next. You know, like, whoa. So in Rome, in, in the times that Paul's writing this, it's the one standing when you're in spiritual wrestling. It's the one standing that's the winner. Now, you will know. Look at the verses. Look at verse 11. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your what? Stand against the devil's schemes. Look at verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, when Satan attacks or one of his demons or one of the fallen angels, you may able to what? Stand your ground, and after you've done everything, after you're spiritually wrestling with the enemy, after you've done everything, to, to, to about, you're still standing. And then verse 14, stand firm. So it's, that's, that's how wrestling is done in Mongolia, many countries, and in the Bible times. It's the one standing that is victorious. So... This Easter coming up, I will have been a Christian 46 years. And so I want to coach you that over 46 years of wrestling with Satan, and we still wrestle, um, I want to give you tips as a coach in wrestling with the spiritual enemy. First of all, I want you to understand there are clearly two sides. We're on the Lord's side, and there is the 
other team, the other side. On my side, I have coaches, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and uh, Satan is coaching on, on the, his demons and fallen angels. And, and I want to tell you that Satan is so crafty and sneaky, and, and often he tag teams. And I notice in my life, it, it's one thing when only one enemy comes at you, but Satan often likes to team hit you. So I notice when I watch professional wrestling, for those that think it's real, okay. Uh, um, but even if it's fake, I go, that's amazing. The guy just got thrown through the air and landed on his back 30 feet and s still moves. Um, but in professional wrestling, like the referee, it's, it's a good guy against a bad guy. And, and the good guy's winning. He's beating up the bad guy, and he's so successful. But all of a sudden, the referee gets sidetracked. It's, it's part of the show. And, and he's talking to some person, complaining. And while the referee is looking over the ring to this person, two other wrestlers come on that are the bad wrestlers. And they start beating up on the good guy, because now there's three of them against the one guy. And they're beating him and pummeling him, and everyone's shouting to the referee, referee, look, look, they're cheating, they're cheating. The, the good guy's getting all beat up. And then, of course, the, after they beat him up, the, the two get off, and the referee turns back and goes, hey, what? Ah, oh, the good guy's getting, he's down now. He didn't see, he didn't, you know. You with me? Do you guys watch Professor? Okay. So, I notice Satan will do that. Like, he'll, he likes to attack you from multiple directions. So, he might attack you financially and physically, or might attack you through your family and through work. And, or like, he, he, he doesn't come one at a time. Sometimes like multiple attacks. Now, here's what I want. Let me just share with you that when you become a new believer, it is God that arranges the matches. And God will start you out. He wants you to learn how to wrestle. He wants you to learn how to be victorious, how to stand on your feet. And so he will arrange, so to speak, easier matches for you when you start out as a new Christian. And if God allows two or three attacks at the same time, it's only because he knows that you are ready to take it. So, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So, whatever, don't ever come to me and say, Pastor, I, I, I am defeated. Satan is just too strong for me, and I have no way out. I don't know why God allowed it. That is not true. God is the one that arranges the match, and he always has a way for you to be able to escape, to come out, to be victorious. He knows exactly the match. He's training us to be good wrestlers, just as he did with me. Now, this comes to coach or point two, which is sometimes you do lose, Okay. So I wish I could tell you that all the battles I have, spiritual battles, I win victoriously. I don't. I, I have to learn. I, I, when I fight the enemy, sometimes I fight in my own flesh and I lose. Sometimes I fight with my own wisdom and I lose. Sometimes I just get prideful and I lose. Sometimes I forget that I got to fight in, in, in the power of the spirit and I lose. But it's, it's when I lose that then the Lord says, ah, oh, Joe. Remember, I, I told you, I, I already coached you how, how you can battle this, how you can win. And losing sometimes, and I still lose, okay? Um, it, it humbles you. It helps you to realize that you have to trust in God and his Holy Spirit, that it, you never get strong enough in your own strength and power and your own pride. And, and so every so often, you got to be reminded of this, that you're in spiritual warfare and you have to trust the Lord. But don't, just so you know, when I lose, the Lord comes over. And, Come on, Joe. Let's, let me help you out. In fact, this actually this brings me to the third one. Usually you have breaks in between wrestling matches. So I know this is a picture of a boxing, a boxing corner. 
So you know how it works. You're, you're boxing for so long. Wrestling has three periods. But in boxing, you're boxing so long, and maybe you're getting beat up, OK? And, and the bell rings, which is like, hey, break time. Take a break. And you go to your corner. And in your corner, I notice often the first thing, they're like, ah, oh, you know, I, I needed this break. And, and they squirt. They always, like, give them water. And I'm like, when we're in spiritual warfare, it's like you need a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. You just, and then the coach, the coach is there talking. This is a woman boxer, obviously. The coach is saying, look, I, I told you, when you're wrestling this, this guy, this woman, you, you know, watch for that right uppercut, and, and, and you got to dance around them, and, and, and just reminding, and coaching, and giving, and I notice that, all right, I'm in spiritual wrestling, and it's like I get in the Word of God, and I get reminded from the Spirit of God, I told you how to fight this, I, I, I've given you the moves, I, and you need a fresh feeling, and encouragement, and then back to the battle until you're victorious when Satan... So you'll notice, you notice in verse 13, so when the day of evil comes. So it's not... I can just tell you that you're usually not in spiritual warfare nonstop. If we were in spiritual warfare nonstop, constantly, we, we, none of us would make it. But the Lord has timeouts. You will experience spiritual warfare... And it can be long sometimes, believe me. But eventually you get victorious and the Lord often will give you R&R. &R. He'll give you rest before you move on to the next match. Fourth, remember who the real enemy is. It's Satan and the demons behind the scenes. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. It's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So Christians, I don't know how often we don't fight. Our battle is not with people. I know Satan's using them, but they're puppets. They're, they're, that's what we all used to be. And Satan was using us. The real battle is the devil lurking in the background using this. So I, I tell people, we're not, I know you want to fight politicians and you want to fight drug dealers and you want to fight, you know, whatever, but you need to understand it's a spiritual battle and we don't fight like the world fights. Second Corinthians 10, 3 to 4, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. Here's how the world wages war. What? You just insulted me? I'm insulting you back. That's how the world wages war. Wait a second. You just struck me? I get to punch you two times back. Pow, pow. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. That's how the world fights. That's how politicians fight. That's how, but not Christians. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. No. On the contrary, our weapons which is the armor of God, have divine power to demolish spiritual strongholds. So we fight with spiritual weapons, the sword, the power of prayer. We know it's not against people. That's not the real battle. The battle is the spiritual forces behind that. Fifth, the devil often loves to hang out, as I always say, at church. The devil loves to hang out where God is present. Now, we know in Scripture that Satan actually has access to heaven. He shows up. When God's having a worship service up in heaven, Satan and the false angels actually show up in heaven. It isn't until Revelation chapter 12, it isn't until the future that Satan is permanently thrown out of heaven with the evil angels. 
But right now, he shows up to heaven in the midst of the holy, holy, holies and, and everyone praising God and the saints and the angels. Satan shows up with the evil angels and accuses the brethren. Oh, God, look at those people down on earth. What losers. They oh, look, have just deny knowing you. Oh, look at the sin there. And, you know, Satan loves. He, he, he's a religious devil. In the Bible, every time there was a great moving of God, Satan shows up. Satan shows up. Elijah had a great victory on Mount Carmel, and then Satan showed up. There was this revival in Asbury, and I don't know what you want to think of the revival, but I know that thousands of young people were impacted, and Jesus really moved in their life. What scares me is they didn't have any preaching of the word. And I, I just feel bad because I know, because this has happened in my life constantly, every time I have a mountaintop experience at church or somewhere in my life, the next day, Satan lets me have it. It's like, whoa! And I, I feel bad for all these thousands of young people that feel the Holy Spirit because I don't know if they're prepared because the devil is waiting to attack. He just loves to do that. And, and you just need to be prepared to kind of know that after the mountaintop experiences, that's when the devil often likes to come at you. The devil showed up. Can you believe this? Jesus is having his special church service with his disciples, the 12 apostles. It's the only time in Scripture we're told that Jesus sings a hymn so they're singing and they're worshiping. And the Lord says, this is so special. We're going to have the Lord's Supper together. Do you know that Satan showed up for that church service and filled Judas? Satan loves to go to church. In fact, Satan, he loves to come to church and cause trouble. He does. He, he loves to come and get people criticizing. He loves division. He loves bringing false doctrine into churches. He loves bringing false prophets into churches. He loves causing jealousy and envy and fighting. And he just loves it. He's like, ah, I love, I love going to church and messing with Christians. It's my, one of my favorite activities. Six, we need to realize that the victory is in the Lord and his mighty power. So verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Seventh, we should not be unaware of Satan's schemes. 2 Corinthians 2.11, Paul writes, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. So, this is the coaching manual. Actually, it's very funny to me, well, I... There isn't a move. This is the wrestling manual. There is not a move that Satan has that's not covered in this book. Okay? He's, he has not come up with any new moves. So every move he comes up with, every way he tempts people, every way he attacks you, there is a story, there is coaching in this book how you can have the victory. So I went on the internet and I looked up what are the main ways that Satan tempts people in the United States? And I looked at like seven surveys of Americans and a lot of them overlapped. And so I put them together and here's what they were. First one almost on all the list was eating too much. And this battle I am still fighting myself. So I went to the doctors two weeks ago and the doctor said, Joe, you're cancer free but you have high blood pressure and you're going to have a stroke. He didn't say it, but that's what he implied. And you need to lose weight. And I'm like, doctor, I've been fighting this for 20 years. 20 years. I, I kiddingly say, as I've gotten older, my body is so efficient that one piece of lettuce has enough calories for a whole day for me to live on. <laughs> And so when I eat two pieces of lettuce, I gain fat. It's incredible. What happened to the day I could eat five meals and lose weight? So, but it is a battle. Some of my relatives, 
close relatives have had strokes because of high blood pressure at my age. So it's like, oh boy. But it's like a spiritual battle. It's like, I can't, I've tried to do this in the flesh. I try to not eat. It is tough. Alcohol, drugs, spending too much money, jealousy, envy, lying, laziness, sexual sins, worry, anxiety, venting on social media. I thought that was interesting, that that was on a lot of the list. And when I first saw that, I said to myself, ah, here's a new, here's a new play from Satan that it's probably not covered in the Bible. And then God was, come on, Joe. You're in Ephesians? Ephesians chapter 6, turn the page to Philippians. Just turn the page, like one page. Does it take you to Philippians? All right, look at chapter 2. You in chapter 2? Look at verse 14. It says, do everything without what? Grumbling or arguing or venting so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And I'm like, there it is. It's just that we do it on social media now, but there there it is. God's like, hey, do everything without grumbling and venting and arguing so that you're going to shine out in the world that they vent and they argue and all that stuff, but you're going to shine out as like, I'm not going to complain. I'm a child of the king. I, I am joint heirs with Jesus Christ. I'm going to heaven. I have everything in Christ. I don't have any reason to vent or complain or to, you know, so prideful attitude. I notice my spiritual battles you know, I went through, you know, what we would consider the big sins when I first got saved. But I've discovered, so those sins are easy now. Like, I've become strong in the faith. So if I get tempted to smoke, you are not going to win demon of smoking. Demon of porno- pornography. These are past. But the, the sins of pride and ego and subtle judging sins, and it's like, oh, man, I, these are way tougher. And, and God's just now working in areas, deep areas in my life that I never even knew were there. So, all right, I don't have time because we're, sorry, all good points. Um, hey, I'm not even going to do this. Let me have the worship team. I, I want to open the, the altar because it's more important. And um, I'm going to wait till the worship team comes out, wherever they're lurking or hiding. They're like, what are you finishing so early for? <laughs> All right, we got the drummer. We should just, we'd be the first church that only does worship with drums. That's it. (laughs) All right. Oh, now, here comes. I know, Don, I probably threw them off. I take it. (laughs) I want to, so my wife and I, let me just share a testimony. So sometimes Satan is like really attacking us. We're attacking someone in our family. And we would attempt to deal with it ourselves. And I've shared this with you before. And when we would keep it to ourselves because of our pride, and we didn't want anyone in the church to know that the pastor had problems, we were always being defeated. Then when we swallowed our pride... And, and would go to the altar and ask the elders to pray for whatever we were going through, whether it's marriage, our kids, finding it, what We discovered the power of saints praying. And, and we discovered that when we shared it with the elders and deaconesses, that they not only would pray for us at the altar, but like through the week, they would remember, and like maybe the next week they would say, how are you doing, Pastor? I've been praying for that, that thing you shared with us. 
At one time, my wife and I were in spiritual warfare for years. And for two years, every Sunday, we went to the altar. Two years. 102 Sundays. We went to the altar. By the end of the two years, every single person in the church knew what we were praying about. But it was amazing when, first of all, we could really tell a difference in our spiritual battle. And it wasn't all the time, but it was a battle with our kids. It would come and go. It would come and go. But we knew we were in this battle. So we, we constantly, everyone in the church was praying for us, as well as we knew everyone else that was in spiritual battle. That's why I like open up the altar every Sunday. And, and eventually the Lord got the victory. But I tell you what, we, we had to do it. We needed the strength. We needed the prayer power. The, you know, we could, not, we could not get victory in ourselves. So are any of you, some of you may be, hey, the devil's leaving me alone right now. Praise God. Some of you may be saying, no, I am being attacked right now. I'm in the midst of spiritual warfare, and you could use the prayer of saints. So, Cecilia, start playing, because I, I want you to go and start playing. Um, let's stand, and I want you to come and let one of the elders, godly women, pray with you. If you're in spiritual warfare, I, I want you to come. Heavenly Father, we pray for all of those that have come forward and anyone that was unable to we pray in the name of Jesus that they would be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power and that Lord you gave us a promise that we would be able to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy and so we join with them in resisting Satan in the name of Jesus we pray whether, Lord, they're here praying for themselves or praying for someone else, we pray for the victory through the blood of Jesus Christ and that they would be able to stand strong in you and you alone. And um, may you do spiritual warfare on their behalf. May the enemies that are coming at them flee in seven directions. Um, and we'll give you the praise and the glory. We are weak and unable to in ourselves, in our own flesh, with our own wisdom, in our own strength. We need you, Jesus. You are the one that has conquered the enemy. And you're the one that can do it in us and through us and for us. And we give you thanks for being our great deliverer. Bless us as we go. In your name we pray. Amen.